morning. Good morning. Technically, technology channels, I guess. <laughs> now, I believe that I'm very loud. So they leave. They go back to Balaam. Well, Balaam gets 
gets the news and he's not happy about that. And he says, ah, I, just, I just need to up the ante. That's it. That's what I'm going to do. So he sends an even larger group back to Baal. More nobles, more princes, more money, more servants, just all you could possibly want. And then he gets there and he's looking around at all of these things and all this money and all these people. And he says, you know what? Let me ask God again what he says. And he inquires again of the Lord. And this time God says, it's okay. Go ahead and go with them. But only do what I tell you to do. And only say what I tell you to say. And so he goes. And then along the way, God tries to kill him not once, not twice, but three times. And we'll get to that in just a few moments. You see, there are some who say that, that Balaam just a sorcerer. Not a prophet of God in any way. Had no real ties with the Lord Almighty. But think about it. If he were, you see, Balaam wants, wants Balaam to get there and he wants him to curse those Israelites. Because he knows that if God is behind him and he curses them, then they'll be cursed. And Balaam has this reputation that those he blesses, they're blessed, and those he curses, they're cursed. And so he wants that to happen. Now, if he were just a pagan, nobody, a sorcerer, a rich doctor, it wouldn't matter. He could curse God all day long. It's not a big deal. In fact, they did that quite often. But it's important to notice how Balaam responds when he talks to Balaam's messengers. In Numbers 22, 8, he says this. They will show up, they tell him everything, and he says, I need to inquire of the Lord. In 22, Numbers 22, 8, Balaam says, stay here, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. Now, I want you to notice the word Lord there on the screen. It's in all caps. And so anytime you see God or Lord in all capitals in your English translation, that's the translator's way of saying that's God's actual name. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. And so that, that's very important because a pagan God isn't going to pray necessarily to the Lord to seek guidance. And so we can see that he's not just praying to some pagan God, some little g God. He's praying to the Lord of the Israelites, the God that you and I serve today. Well, he's on his way, right? Because he prays a second time. And God says, go ahead and go. It's all right. But only do what I tell you to. And only say what I tell you to say. So Balaam heads that way. Or excuse me, Balaam heads that way. See, I'm getting the names confused now. It can be easy. Balaam starts heading that way, and the Lord tries to kill him. And so we got to wonder what happened in that. Well, I can't tell you 100% what happened, because I just don't know. But I have a feeling, I have a feeling that Balaam was just too enticed by what he saw. He saw all those gifts, and he got excited about that. Okay, remember, it's a semi-religious guy, okay? One foot in religion and one foot in the world. And, and he says, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you bring and wealth and how much we talk about. I, mean, I kind of might have had that little bit of just an enticement there. This huge group, this prestige, this power, this wealth. And he starts thinking, maybe I better ask God again. God, what do you think? Am I so sure? Look around. It looks pretty good to me. And, and so... That may have been what started that ball rolling. And I believe somewhere along the way, Balaam thought, I'm going to stay with God all the way until I get there. But when I get there, I'm going to curse those Israelites. Because then I get my stuff. And I like my stuff. And so he may have been thinking that, trying to fool God. But we know we can't fool God. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4 says, You have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. 
Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, oh Lord. It means I can't say anything. I can't do anything. I can't think anything without God already knowing what's going on in my head, in my heart. I can't post on Facebook without God already knowing what I'm going to say and what kind of heart it's going from. There's no fooling God. And yet he tries. So God sends an angel to kill him. Now think about that for a second. Do you really think God would have sent an angel to kill him if he wanted him dead? I don't think so. I look at the examples of Ananias and Sapphira and Ananias and Sapphira in uh, Acts. Boy, they lied to the Holy Spirit and they dropped dead just like that. I don't believe the angel was there necessarily to kill Balaam, but to teach him a few lessons. The first lesson of which is don't mess with God. <laughs> Pretty clear message right here. Don't try to manipulate God or the things that God, the other things that belong to God, because it's dangerous. It's scary. It can be downright deadly if God wants it to be. You know, I think about a preacher who decided that he needed to paint the outside of the building, the church building. Hell, it was run down. It was a mess. It needed to be it out really, really bad. And so he goes and he gets his uh, he gets his budget requirements from the elders, and they tell him that he's allowed to spend. He goes out, he buys paint, he buys all that he's allowed to buy, and he's sitting there looking at it, and he realizes he doesn't have enough paint to get the whole building covered as he needs to. So he decides he's going to mix a little water with the paint. He's just going to thin it, just stretch it, just a little bit. And so he's doing that, and he's got his roller, and he's painting, and he's looking at the paint, he's looking at the building, he's realizing he's to add some more water. And so he keeps adding water, he keeps thinning the paint down more and more, and painting and painting. Finally gets done with the whole building, he's got about a cup of paint left, that's how close it was. Ah, he steps back and he looks and he says, all right, I'm good. So he goes home. The next day, he arrives at the building, but overnight, it was a horrible weather storm. And the rains just washed all the paint right off the building. And he's standing there and he's looking at it and he sees this mess and the building looks terrible again. again and he says, ah, oh, Lord, what do I do? And a voice from heaven says, repaint and thin no more. <laughs> so mess with God. Do you try to mess with God? I'm telling you, repent and sin no more. It's not a good idea. You don't want God coming up against you. God will not be mocked. Let's get it straight. This is his church. It's not mine. It's not yours. Doesn't belong to the people who left last week, last month, last year, or 10 or 20 years ago. It belongs to God. That's it, period. And the moment we take our eyes off that, that's the moment we start to have troubles. We can't ridicule God. He will not be mocked. We can't curse his church or his people or his will and think that we're going to get away with it. Because if we do, we're just fooling ourselves and we're no different than Balaam. So that first message, don't mess with God. But I believe the second message is a bit more encouraging. And that's simply that God will not give up on you easily. You know, we're going to mess up. It's, it's going to happen for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're going to mess up. There are going to be times where, where we just totally take, we derail, we mess up, we flub, whatever. It's going to be bad. But the good news, the great news, is that God doesn't quit on us. God puts obstacles in our paths to try to slow us down. And so Balaam is experiencing that. He's riding on his donkey. He's heading for what? He, he's got his agenda. Here's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. And that's why I'm going there. And it's right here. And he's not trying to stray from that at all. That's what he has said in his mind. And he's moving along. And the donkey, his donkey, sees this angel of the Lord blocking the path. So she goes this way. 
and she heads off into the field. He takes his staff. That's not the way I want to go. Dude, get back on track. So he starts to strike his donkey. Get back over here. This is where I want to go. And again, walking along, angel of the Lord appears again. This time there's a wall on both sides. Well, the donkey can only go just so far to either side. So she scoops over this way. But because she's doing that, Balaam's foot is crushed between the donkey and the wall. And he gets upset again. Good thing it, good thing it was Balaam and not Bruce Banner, right? Donkey <laughs> been ripped to shreds. So he takes his staff again. He starts to strike the donkey. Get back over here, dog. This is where I want to go. Again, a third time. The donkey looks up and sees the angel of the Lord. At this time, there's nowhere to go on the path. Nowhere. She can't go to the left. She can't go to the right. There's no getting around this angel. So she just lays down. She doesn't know what else to do. And again, she can see the angel, but Balaam can't. And I really believe it's because Balaam was so blinded by his own greed, by his own selfishness, his own agenda blinded him. He couldn't even see he was in the presence of God. And so he takes his staff, and again, he starts to strike the donkey. And then the donkey speaks. I've never heard a talking donkey outside of a track. <laughs> so I imagine that was a pretty interesting comment. In fact, as I read through it, I'm thinking, really? He replied to the donkey? I mean, if the, if the donkey spoke to me, I think that would be enough. He'd be like, okay, game over, drop my staff. What's going on here? But no, he talks to the donkey. Now, I, I believe that the real miracle is not that the donkey spoke. I believe the real miracle is that Balaam's eyes were open, finally, and he did see the Lord. You know, I, I, as I read the text, I realized, I don't know anything about donkeys. I, I'm a city boy, born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and lived in big cities basically my whole life, including Phoenix, what do you know? So I realized I didn't know much about donkeys, so I did a little research. And I want to share it with you. Donkeys were kind of like all-purpose vehicles to, uh, to farmers back in the first century. They're kind of like ATVs. They were highly dependable. Now, contrary to popular belief, they were actually very gentle and very friendly. But yet, we think of a donkey as mule-headed, stubborn. You gotta pull the rope and the donkey just sits there and doesn't want to move because they're stubborn, right? Actually, according to horsechannel.com, <laughs> this is true. It wasn't even a joke. According to horsechannel.com, that's natural instinct for a donkey. When they sense danger, they freeze up. And they're trying to keep themselves safe, plus they're trying to keep their rider safe. So when Balaam's donkey just laid it down, she was doing something that was very, very natural for her to do. Keeping herself safe, because she didn't know if it was danger, and keeping her rider safe as well. So donkeys are actually very valuable to God's people, and even to God himself. You know, I, I did some more research Look through the Bible. Donkeys are in most of the major biblical stories that we find. Genesis 22. Abraham saddles his donkey as he's going to take Isaac to the mountain to sacrifice him. Genesis 42. Joseph's brothers, they come up to Egypt to get food. They brought donkeys. Exodus chapter 4. Moses is going to go to see Pharaoh and get God's people and bring them out, and then he brings a donkey. And of course we know Jesus rode on the colt of a donkey just a week before his crucifixion. So donkeys were very, very important to God's people, but also, like I said, to God himself. Remember last week we talked about the unclean and the clean birds? Remember those clean and unclean animals from the Old Testament? And the unclean animals could not be offered for a sacrifice? According to Exodus 13, a donkey was one of those animals that was allowed to be used as a sacrifice. The only unclean, as a matter of fact. According to Exodus 23, 12, the law required if a donkey was, or excuse me, law required that a donkey was to not work or move. It had to rest completely on a Sabbath day. You couldn't put that thing to work. I don't think you could even whistle or call over to you. I'm not sure, but, but you couldn't put that thing to work. It had to rest under the law. Exodus 22, 4 says that if a donkey was stolen, the thief had to pay back twice the value of the donkey 
Exodus 23, 5 says, if you see a donkey of someone who hates you and it's fallen down under a load, do not let it leave, do not leave it there. Be sure to help it with it. And the donkey is mentioned in Exodus 20, verse 17, the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, or your neighbor's donkey. You have to remember when you guys can go home today. Don't be coming in that donkey. So donkeys were highly valuable to God's people and to God himself. And three times, Balaam tries to get that donkey to go where he wants her to go. Three times, his agenda is right here. This is where I'm going. And three times, God stands in the way of that and says, no, it's not happening. That's because God didn't want to give up on Balaam. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not slow in keeping his promise, as some count slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. God didn't want to give up on Balaam. He doesn't want to give up on you or I either. That's why Jesus spent his time with, with those who were considered lowly by the cultural standards. Those who lacked education. Those who didn't have great financial situations or any good standing really whatsoever in the community. That's why Jesus spent his time with those who were prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners, because Jesus didn't give up on people. Now, he didn't overlook their sin, and he didn't excuse it, but he didn't believe that people could never change. Because over the centuries, many people have changed through the blood of Christ. And God is going to use whatever means possible to accomplish his will. Now, here's the good news, okay? You have an opportunity to fulfill God's will. But you can't do it if you're like Balaam. You can't do it if you're blinded by your own desires. You can't do it. You take your focus off Christ, and you start to look at all those pretty things around you and start to be enticed. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, right? It's usually because there's more new views over there. We don't think about that much. So. You need to be like Balaam's donkey. Now there's a message for you. Good thing I'm not using the King James Version today, huh? Go, you never believe what the preacher told me I needed to be like. Some of you will get that. Some of you might need to look in the King James Version later. You need to be like that lowly donkey. You know, I believe that God used Balaam's donkey for several reasons. One, it was something that he trusted. It was something that he depended upon. Balaam had. And third, I believe because, you know that donkey? It was just stubborn enough and mule-headed enough to do whatever it took, no matter what the cost. That's the kind of servant God wants you to be. He wants you to, to talk to those in your lives that need Jesus. Those who trust you. Those who depend upon you. And he wants you to be mule-headed and stubborn enough to stick with it until they surrender to Christ Jesus. But more than that, God wants somebody who's willing to stand between their friends and judgment. Because folks, that is what donkey talk is all about. Let's pray. Father, I am